This talk is on pigment dispersion syndrome and pigmentary glaucoma, a condition I really have a lot of interest in, and so I may have more pictures and more detail in here than you really want. But at least in my clinic, it's a very, very common disease. So in, in this syndrome, pigment is liberated from the posterior iris and is deposited throughout the anterior segment of the eye. And this is called pigment dispersion syndrome. So you look in, you see pigment on the cornea in the angle behind the iris. That's pigment dispersion syndrome. In some individuals, the pigment damages the trabecular meshwork, which can lead to an elevated intraocular pressure. And in some of those people will lead to optic nerve damage. And then that is pigmentary glaucoma. So not everyone who gets pigment dispersion syndrome will go on to get pigmentary glaucoma. But somewhere between a quarter and a half will. This is a very common secondary glaucoma. Not as common as exfoliation syndrome, but at least in my population where I work, it's extremely common. The pathophysiology appears to be that during blinking and or accommodation, the iris bows backward, as you can see on the right hand sketch here. And then the pigment epithelium, which is like coal dust, rubs against the zonules and frees up pigment. That pigment collects in the posterior segment, in the posterior chamber, I should say, and then also goes through the pupil into the anterior segment. And the, when it comes through the pupil, uh, it is warm and so it rises and then it falls as it hits a cool cornea. And that's why you see this vertical deposition called a Krukenberg spindle, which we'll see in just a second. But that's the mechanism that leads to that. It also accumulates here in the trabecular meshwork. It also accumulates at the posterior part of the lens where the zonules and the vitreous face join. And that's a Shea stripe. And we'll show all those. So this is considered to be reverse pupillary block. And again, causes the iris pigment epithelium to rub against the zonules. So in the angle, the trabecular meshwork endothelial cells phagocytize this pigment. And eventually the cells can be damaged and lost, causing trabecular dysfunction and elevated intraocular pressure. This is an early onset glaucoma, often diagnosed in the 20s and 30s, most commonly diagnosed in Caucasians. Caucasians often have thinner irides, and the diagnosis is easier to make because if the thin light irises are easier to see translumination defects in. But, but the disease is more common in Caucasians. It's not just an easier diagnosis. And most of these patients are myopic. It's unusual to see pigment dispersion syndrome or pigmentary glaucoma in a hyperopic patient. There's really no difference in the risk of developing pigment dispersion syndrome, but more men are likely to progress to pigmentary glaucoma and they tend to do so younger than in women. And while there are a few families with pigment dispersion syndrome, pigmentary glaucoma, the inheritance is not striking in my experience. And we've actually been looking for families and have found very few. Like primary open angle glaucoma, pigmentary glaucoma is generally asymptomatic until late in the course of the disease when they have visual field loss and all the other symptoms that one would see in any sort of advanced glaucoma. However, sometimes in these patients, uh, because they are young and often active, uh, very jarring exercise like basketball, volleyball, racquetball can cause a sudden pigment release with symptomatic blurring from very high intraocular pressures.
Pharmacologic dilation can also release pigment and cause the pressure to go up. So it's a photogenic disease. What we see on the cornea is this vertical line of pigment on the endothelium called a Krukenberg spindle. And again, that's because the warm aqueous comes through the pupil, hits the cold cornea, and then falls, depositing the pigment as it falls. This pigment then is phagocytized into the corneal endothelium, and again called a Krukenberg spindle. A nice picture here just showing the endothelial pigment generally does not affect the vision and it doesn't really seem to harm the endothelium. A few more striking Krukenberg spindles here and this patient really has tremendous amount of pigment on the corneal endothelium. She had 2040 vision that I could believe was due to her cornea. In the angle, there's a dark black pigmentation, much darker than exfoliation syndrome, where the iris pigment epithelium is mixed in with the exfoliative material and, and gives that brown sugar look. And we also see in the angle back bowing of the iris, especially in young people, and that tends to go away. And we'll talk about that in a second. So this is actually a very old drawing from Lee Allen painted before pigment dispersion syndrome was described by Sugar and Barber in the late 40s. But you can see this very dark, almost like it was drawn with a marking pen, uh, pigment in the, in the angle. This patient was on a cholinergic agonist. You can see a small pupil. Very dark pigmentation and very marked back bowing in this young myopic patient. This patient is Chinese visiting the U.S. as a student, but uh, I think pigment dispersion syndrome is not common in Asia. But he had perhaps the most impressive back bowing that I've ever seen. You can see a shea stripe here. We'll talk about that in a second. Marked pigmentation in the angle, and then really dramatic back bowing. As we move back in the iris, you can see these translumination defects that overlie packets of zonules and you can imagine that these radial zonules were the cause of these defects. These are hard to see. You can either use a Finhoff to transluminate through the sclera or uh, shine light down through the pupil as the photographer did here. It's very useful to be dark adapted when you do this because these findings are pretty subtle. And for people who have very dark irides, uh, it can be almost impossible to see translumination defects. We've done some work with infrared video that just shows these very nicely. On the iris, if you have a light colored iris, sometimes you can see pigment dusted on the surface, as you can see here. And again, you, you wouldn't see this in someone with a dark brown iris. And rarely, one can see heterochromia if you have asymmetric pigment dispersion. This just shows a person over the course of four years had really active pigment dispersion. And you can see how much pigment was deposited on the surface of the iris. And this is a patient uh, who has a bigger pupil and more pigment on this side, which has more pigment dispersion syndrome, more translumination defects on the other side. And then behind the iris, you can see this line of pigment called a shea stripe, or some people call it a Zentmeyer line. So that's a deposition of pigment at the junction of the posterior zonules and the vitreous face. Just some other examples. It's very pretty sometimes against the red reflex. This is really helpful to look for in patients uh, who have dark, dark brown irises because this is a way that you can make the diagnosis without having translumination defects. And sometimes if the patient dilates very well, you can even see it.
without gonioscopy. You don't see this type of pigment uh, with exfoliation syndrome, and I think the reason is because in exfoliation syndrome, the pigment is released right at the pupil, so it really has no access to the posterior chamber uh, like it does in pigment dispersion syndrome. This is a really, I think, beautiful picture of lattice degeneration uh, of the retina, and I put it in here just to remind us that these people are at substantial risk for retinal detachment, much more than you would expect just with their myopia. And it's up to 10% of studies have shown 6 to 8 to 10% of individuals with pigment dispersion syndrome will develop retinal detachment. So it's really good to talk to them about the signs and symptoms. Treatment of pigment dispersion syndrome, all of the same medical treatment that we normally do for open angle glaucoma. We don't use cholinergics much anymore, but this would be a bad population to use cholinergics in because of the risk of retinal detachment. And they're also poorly tolerated in young myopic uh, patients. Trabeculoplasty, which generally does not work well in younger patients, uh, can work in these patients because unlike most young patients, they have uh, pigmented angles. Sometimes they can have a marked reaction to the laser and there are uh, sometimes would use argon laser trabeculoplasty rather than the selective laser trabeculoplasty to keep from freeing up so much pigment. But the effect may not be long lasting. Laser iridotomy can eliminate back bowing and there are widely variable options on the uh, opinions, I'm sorry, on the use of iridotomy. I tend to do iridotomies sparingly. Uh, I do them in young patients with marked back bowing and elevated pressure, but not in people who have end-stage disease with marked glaucoma damage on three medications. People who have symptomatic uh, pigment dispersion where they play basketball and have markedly elevated intraocular pressures, uh, I would tend to do it in patients like that. But the number I do is really quite small. This is a former fellow of mine showing this marked backbowing before we did an iridotomy and then after the iridotomy. And he did have <clears throat> very marked pressure elevation with uh, with basketball. And this is that same patient, ultrasound biomicroscopy showing marked back bowing on the left screen and resolution of that on the right. There's a study that just came out in 2014 by Stefano Gandolfi and his group. And what they did was look at patients with pigment dispersion syndrome and treated them with phenylephrine to see if there was a pressure elevation indicating active disease. And those that responded with the pressure elevation were considered to be high risk. And of those, one eye received a uh, laser iridotomy, the, the other eye did not. And at 10 years, the iridotomy eye had a lower likelihood of pressure elevation uh, than the eye that did not have the iridotomy and that their risk of pressure elevation was as low as the low risk group, those 10 years before who did not respond to phenylephrine. So that's sort of saying the same thing that I've gravitated towards. People who have active disease, marked back bowing, they're young. Those are people who it's probably reasonable to do an iridotomy on, but somebody who's 50 years old without back bowing or somebody who's on a lot of medications, it's probably not a great idea. Surgical options are the same as for other glaucomas, other open angle glaucomas. Remember though that these are often young myopic individuals and so one needs to be careful of hypotony maculopathy. It's an interesting disease because with time the pupil becomes smaller and the lens becomes thicker and this makes the back bowing go away. And so occasionally the glaucoma will burn out. 
the patient stops actively dispersing pigment because of these anatomic changes that occur with age. So you really need to look for old pigment dispersion syndrome pigmentary glaucoma in patients who present as normal tension glaucoma. So they come in with normal intraocular pressures but cupping and field loss. And in some of those individuals, if you look hard, you will see evidence that they had pigment dispersion, pigmentary glaucoma in the past that has now run its course. One sign you can look for is pigment reversal where the angle is more pigmented above than below. So almost always the angle, it, because of gravity, is more pigmented below than above. But in these people you can see reversal of that pigmentation as you can see in this patient. The inferior angle, very little pigment, and as I rotate the lens here, you can see that there's a lot of pigment up above. And so this is somebody who had old pigment dispersion, pigmentary glaucoma presented with cupping and field loss, but a normal pressure. And what we might be seeing in this individual is damage that occurred when they were in their 30s. There are some secondary causes um, sulcus and trochlear lenses, uh, like you see on the right here, can occasionally rub on the iris and release pigment. Angle recession, iris cysts, these are all fairly uncommon. So the key points is, the key points are that this is a common secondary glaucoma. Mostly seen in myopic Caucasians, but everybody has some risk. You should consider it in normal tension glaucoma patients. You won't see that a lot, but I've seen it several times. And these patients are at substantial risk for retinal detachment, and you need to warn them about that. So pigment dispersion syndrome, if you work in a population that has a large Caucasian component, uh, you will see a lot of pigment dispersion over the course of your career, and it's good to know how to think about it and how to manage it.